Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ambassador Obama. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to the U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador Richard Obama, who has been here in India for about two years now. I remember friend, we were talking while coming up with the lift that this time has literally flown by. Because there has been such intense activity between the two countries over this period. Ever since he has uh, been here, as a matter of fact, they brought a, brought a new found energy between these two countries and uh, we found that the strategic convergence of interest really of the two countries with the two leaders, um, with Prime Minister Modi here and uh, uh, President Obama there in the US, they've had very, very good understanding and the two countries have done a lot of work together. As a matter of fact, uh, in this period, India has also been granted the status of a major defense partner with the US. And uh, a lot of discussion and other things have uh, taken place in that. But defense is not the only sector. There has been a uh, lot of work on the, the trade, the health, science, even climate. Uh, climate, of course, with the new president-elect now, I do not know how we will to define the uh, climate part because uh, there is some doubts on that, but that's a separate issue. As it stands today, India is committed in that direction very much, and India is going to work on it uh, seriously. And uh, we are uh, looking at that direction with, uh, with great aims and uh, with objectives which have been defined, and we we'll work towards that. Uh, next year is also the uh, Global uh, Entrepreneurship Summit in India, in which a very large number of entrepreneurs from all over the world are expected to come. So let's see how does that go, but there's a very major event which is on. Uh, we have today, uh, if you go to any university in the US, you will find a very large number of Indian students, Indian and Chinese, these are the two communities which are very heavily represented. And we have over a lakh and a 66,000 students today studying in the US. And of course, the Indian community in the US is one of the, um, uh, the one which is doing the best, perhaps. And also it adds a lot of um, wealth to that country, it provides a lot of wealth to that country, because it's all doing very well in that place. So uh, between India and the US, I think this is amongst the best time that we are having. And uh, I do hope that it will carry on. But that aside, so Ambassador is very kind of you to come today and uh, join us on this very important uh, discussion of two days, where the U.S. Embassy have been our partner besides the Facebook. And if you recall, two years back also we had a similar uh, discussion in which the Maryland University and the Facebook and the U.S. Embassy were our partners. So we've had one day a very good discussion, and it'll be very nice to hear your views on uh, how do you feel uh, that this benefit of terrorism can be taken care of and curbed uh, in the world, because it is now something which is getting out of uh, proportions. So on to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and on to the uh, U.S. Ambassador for his views. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's good, good to be back. I see a lot of uh, distinguished faces in the audience, and uh, we have been such a close partner with uh, the Kananda Foundation over the years, and we're really excited to be here again, and, and thank you for your uh, incredible sponsorship of, of this event, and just our ability to get together like this on such important topics. Um, and it's also hard to believe that I've uh, kind of rounded the two-year mark. Uh, we're over, over two years, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, I was very honored and, and pleased to have uh, made it to all 29 Indian states. I, last week I uh, was in Mizoram and Sikkim. I told them I saved the best for last. Um, but it, it was, uh, it's an amazing journey to travel around India and see both the incredible diversity, but also <laughs> some of the challenges and connectivity, some of the infrastructure challenges. Um, but boy, oh boy, the huge potential that um, 
exists around the country and the youth that are excited about what their future holds. And that's what I come away from in my tour here most, I guess, enthused about is the place that India has in this century and the huge amount of excitement. And I've said this to many of you over uh, times before. If you look out at the year 2030, India will lead the world in almost every category. Number of people, size of the middle class, number of college graduates, um, third largest economy, third largest military, and uh, constitutional democracy. It's military overseen by civilians. Uh, you know, these are values that bring us together. They are values that propel India forward. And, and yes, we may be going through a rough patch in terms of um, instability in, the, in Asia and, and, and perhaps globally, um, but I'm confident, as the President and Prime Minister tell us, that if the U.S. and India are the closest of partners, then the, the world uh, will be a safer place. So it's been, it's been an incredibly gratifying um, two plus years. I'm not gonna go through all of the achievements. You've covered a, a few of them, but let's just say in our nine meetings between the President and Prime Minister, our three summits, our 100 new initiatives, our 40 government to government working groups, we have been able to show people that this relationship actually produces for ordinary people. And when you have doubts about globalization, when you have doubts about the modern economy, uh, to be able to show a relationship that produces tangible benefits for both people, I think is, is really important. And I also just say, when the Prime Minister went to Washington this summer, he said something very interesting to the Congress. He said, he said two things, he said, we have overcome the hesitations of history. Overcome the hesitations of history because all of you know there has been this gravitational pull on the relationship that has kept us from reaching our full potential. And I think that is now behind us. And secondly, he said, it is in your interest, the United States, for India to be strong and for India to be prosperous. It's in your strategic interest and we fully believe that. We fully believe that. So. Uh, that's why the president has been so strongly supportive of uh, India as a global power. But let me, um, let me get on uh, to the subject at hand and again thank our host, uh, Vivekananda International, uh, General Vidge, for inviting me here. Uh, as you know, the U.S. Embassy has a long history of partnership with BIF, including the November 2015 workshop we hosted together on building opportunities for public-private partnership encountering online radicalization. I'd also like to acknowledge my State Department colleague, Irfan Saeed from the Counterterrorism Bureau CBE office, just arrived this morning, there he is, um, as well as civil society partners, Brian Fishman, who's representing the New America Foundation. Is Brian here? Brian, good to see you. Uh, Sarah Zeiger, who's here on behalf of the Hadaya Center. Sarah, thank you for being here. And really, they are the real experts. All of you are the real experts when it comes to countering uh, violent extremism, so I'd appreciate it if you save the toughest questions uh, for them. In today's uh, complicated global landscape, a wide variety of security challenges, including conventional threats from states cyber attacks, environmental challenges, and terrorism strain the international order. And in an interconnected world where, where the march of the digital revolution continues unabated, combating these cross-border challenges is becoming increasingly complex. And this is especially true when it comes to terrorism a varied and nebulous problem that requires us to continuously revamp our approaches in order to stay ahead of emerging threats. While no cause or grievance justifies terrorism, it is also important for us to examine how and why young people may be driven to commit heinous acts of violence. The potential factors driving violent extremism differ across communities and countries, 
It could be linked to individual psychology as well as religious, economic, political, or sectarian grievances. India has sadly long been a victim of terrorism in various guises. As I mentioned earlier this week, I was in the state of uh, Mizoram in India's northeast, which was at one time afflicted by a serious ethnic insurgency. Fortunately, political accommodation in recent years has led to a return to normalcy, and Mizoram enjoys one of the highest rates of voter participation in India. The ballot box has replaced armed violence. I believe there needs to be more scholarly work examining India's approach to northeastern insurgencies and whether lessons learned can be applied to the broader challenges of violent extremism. On its western border, India faces a daunting challenge from terrorist groups operating from inside Pakistan. Some of these groups, including Lashkar, Itaiba, the Haqqani Network, and Jashi Muhammad, have also targeted US and Afghan security forces in Afghanistan. The United States continues to press Pakistan at the highest levels to take effective action against these groups. And just last month, we expanded our terrorism designation against LET to include two additional LET leaders and LET's student wing. Actions such as these underscore America's commitment to aggressively target these groups, which threaten the security of India, they threaten the security of Pakistan, and they threaten the region. Now let me turn to a group that has been particularly <coughs> adept at using digital technologies to recruit, radicalize, and finance terrorist activity across borders, which is, of course, ISIL, or Daesh. The internet and social media have been a key component of Daesh's strategy to recruit foreign fighters, 40,000 of whom have poured into Syria over the last four years. That's almost twice as many as we saw travel to Afghanistan in the 1980s. Now, ISIL has faced significant reversals in Iraq and Syria at the hands of the international coalition, but the group remains a clear and present threat, including in South Asia. Daesh operates an official branch in Afghanistan and is looking to expand its presence in India, Bangladesh, and elsewhere. Daesh also uses digital technologies to encourage self-radicalized or lone wolf extremists to conduct heinous attacks near where they are located. Terrorists are no longer simply building bombs and hatching plots in secret. They now post instruction manuals online and urge individuals to commit violence on their own accord. Recent attacks in Germany, Turkey, and Israel and sadly, the list continues to grow, highlight the grim reality that threats posed by lone wolf attacks are not constrained by territorial boundaries and are unlikely to dissipate soon. But regardless of whether it's Daesh or another group, a comprehensive approach to counterterrorism requires countries both to tackle immediate threats and also address underlying factors driving radicalization. We must better understand how extremist messages and propaganda gain currency, particularly among disaffected and alienated young people. When governance fails or economic opportunity wanes, the potential pool of recruits undoubtedly grows, and the internet becomes an even more effective tool to indoctrinate, train, and recruit new fighters. And conferences like this one are important because they focus attention on these issues in a way that's really required. Now, to address evolving threats, we need first to be able to identify, trace, track, and ultimately put out of business terror networks that use the internet. As democratic societies that value free speech and due process, India and the United States have a unique responsibility to strike the right balance. 
The tensions between privacy and security and free speech and maintaining order are not new. But the use of digital technologies has placed these tensions in a newer and sharper focus than in the past. And successful resolution is not easy. It requires careful coordination between law enforcement and intelligence agencies with private sector partners, such as with Facebook and others. It requires efficient sharing of real-time threat information, and it requires smooth handling of cross-border cases when our mutual legal assistance treaty comes into play. Though challenges inevitably arise, I'm pleased that our cooperation in this area continue to improve. Now second, as I noted during our November 2015 workshop on public-private partnerships in countering violent extremism, success in addressing the underlying drivers of radicalization depends at least partly on empowerment of the private sector, civil society, media, and religious leaders to disseminate alternative narratives. These narratives can counter terrorist propaganda, for example, by amplifying the stories of those who defect from terrorist organizations by showcasing the life of misery as a foreign <coughs> terrorist fighter, and by highlighting the damages, the damage terrorists are inflicting on Muslim communities. And as Indian government and non-government actors consider opportunities for countering violent extremism, I hope they will reflect upon this nation's vast potential for contributing in this area, for no country has more to offer. Again, while no one would claim India is immune from threats, its citizens have by and large resisted the pull of violent extremism. How then can India's vast and vibrant civil society, its universities, its influential clerical establishments, Bollywood and so on, mobilize locally and globally in the fight against violent extremism? Along these lines, I'm gratified to share with you some of the dynamic and developing opportunities civil society actors are applying in the fight against violent extremism. The peer-to-peer -peer challenging extremism program, again in collaboration with Facebook, empowers university students to counter pervasive extremism on social media. In, US, in the US state of New York, young women at the Rochester Institute of Technology use the program to create a digital campaign called It's Time, X Out Violent Extremism to extinguish ISIL's use of fear as a motivator. This spring, peer-to-peer -peer will expand to over 300 universities in 70 countries whose students will push back on online hate and extremism and promote tolerance and respect. I'm pleased to note that the US and India are both represented in this roster of nations. <clears throat> Just as peer-to-peer -peer enables university students to amplify their voices, the Strong Cities Network provides resources for municipalities to tackle the sociological, economic, cultural, and psychological drivers of radicalization. Launched at the United Nations in September 2015, the Strong Cities Network is the first ever global network of mayors, municipal level policymakers, and practitioners united against violent extremism. The network links communities, CBE professionals, and local political leaders with their counterparts around the world through the sharing of best practices and facilitation of CBE collaboration. In less than two years, the network has expanded to around 80 cities. Now this is a good start, and much more is possible. And once again, I'm gratified that both the US and Indian cities are represented, with Mumbai bearing the standard for India. As we move forward, let us remember the potential in partnership. We all know how bureaucratic stovepiping inside our own agencies and governments hampers responses to terrorist threats. It hampers responses to terrorist threats. The same applies to cooperation between international partners. 
When we work together effectively by sharing information, evidence, and best practices, we can defeat transnational threats like terrorism. And as I mentioned, the U.S.-India partnership stands as a global example of what is possible. In the last year alone, we signed a new agreement on terrorist screening information and deepened our cooperation in countering JEM and other terrorist groups. Our intelligence sharing has reached unprecedented levels, which has directly helped Indian security agencies foil potential attacks. Yet the nature of the threats we face requires us to identify new avenues for cooperation, not only specific terrorism cases, but systematically as well. Over time, our cooperation against terrorism and violent extremism can and should embrace the largest possible spectrum, including cooperation between our law enforcement academies, our judicial training centers, and our rich civil societies. Given the threats, those of us in government positions should undertake every reasonable effort to foster and support this cooperation. And we have done that, and we will continue to do it. Finally, the world needs India's leadership in countering terrorism. As Secretary Kerry stated during his visit to New Delhi last year, quote, the battle to counter and defeat violent extremists does not rest with any one nation and cannot be won by any single campaign. It is a global cause requiring a consistent focus and persistent action, a willingness to adapt our tactics as threats evolve, and a commitment to tackling this challenge at every level, in the security of our airlines, cities, and ports, in the flow of money and arms across our borders, in the integrity of judicial and law enforcement personnel, in the battle of ideas waged in schools, houses of worship, and on social media. Now, Secretary Kerry spoke eloquently of a global cause worth pursuing. And I think his words capture why U.S.-India counterterrorism cooperation and events like this one are so important. I sincerely hope this conference spurs additional engagements in the future and will translate into real recommendation and action uh, by policymakers. So I congratulate you again for coming together, and I thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to the very uh, good work of the organization, but also the work of all of you coming together with these critically important recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question answer session, but just 10 minutes is the optimum time that we have. So, anybody who's got any question to ask? Yes. Ambassador, I'm glad your swan song for this period has been in the DIF. Uh, I want to, my intervention is triggered by your saying that India should have the leadership in this region. As you're aware, besides the Daesh, which you mentioned, Al-Qaeda, and Taliban, which is very strong in this area, you find that the others, for instance, China, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, are dealing with it. My apprehension is that while you might decline NATO's role in Europe and Eastern Europe, I don't want that to happen in this region, and I feel India by itself, perhaps, looking at the sensitivities of the others, might not be able to assume the leadership Perhaps the answer is something joint between India and US for this region in particular, that is terrorism, counterterrorism, and so on. May I have your comments, please? Thank you. You know, when I um, when I first arrived here, uh, people would tell me, you know, we have uh, great convergence on the east. Act East, uh, Asia Rebalance, but we are, we don't have convergence on the West. And they would list principally three countries. They would list Pakistan, they would list Afghanistan, and they would list Iran. And they would say, you know, we're just not in sync. 
And I'd like to think over the last two years we've actually come into greater uh, <coughs> harmony. And maybe I'll just explain to you what I mean. You know, in Afghanistan, our commander, the commander of the ISAF forces has come to India now, I believe, four times. Uh, General Campbell came twice last year. General Nicholson has been here twice in just the last six months. And the, the importance of that is to come and actually brief on the strategy, brief on the campaign, what's actually happening. But a really interesting component, it is also to can now to request Indian assistance in our efforts. Whereas before, I think there was a, a kind of arm's length view. Uh, we have embraced India's providing of training, uh, which has been very effective, providing now of actual hardware, which has been very welcome and very supportive. Uh, the civil society uh, money and training that you've put in, well over $2 billion of, of Indian uh, assistance has gone into Afghanistan. And so, it, in it, and I know there was a lot of discomfort about the reconciliation talks that were going on that, that have since stopped. Um, but I, I don't think there is distance between us on what we want uh, and what the Afghan people want uh, ultimately which is a peaceful, democratic state, self-governed by the people of Afghanistan, that is not host or a party to terrorist groups, that can present a threat to others, whether that be India or whether that be uh, the United States or others. So, you know, I, I really think by sitting down and working through this, we've come together. So your point about you know, can we do it together? The, the answer is absolutely, and we should. And as, as Secretary Kerry said, it's not up to any one nation. My point, I think, about Indian leadership is just, um, and leadership doesn't have to always be kinetic leadership or involving, you know, uh, troops on the ground. It is also leadership by example of what you've done here in this country. And that sends a strong message globally as well. And, and so uh, we want to be partners in this. The fact that we've been able to sign intelligence sharing agreements in the recent year, the fact that our intelligence cooperation has ramped up, the fact that the complexity of our military exercises has ramped up, all uh, portend a very positive future in this area where, where neither one of us are going to be doing this by ourselves. And we're only going to go as far as our two governments want us to go. And I understand there's limitations on that front as well. And that's what democracies are about, because the people may not want to go as far and as fast as maybe some of the policymakers want to go, and we understand that. Secretary Carter likes to talk about our new relationship as one of a strategic handshake, uh, and also supported by a technological handshake, where we have a common vision of what should happen in this part of the world, a part of the world governed by the and resolving disputes peacefully and, and the strength of international institutions. And and that's really, I think that's really important and a good vision. So I, I support uh, the, what you've said in the, in the premise of your question. All right, uh, Thank you. So I have two questions, Sujit. Please keep it short. And one question after that, please, that's them. Because you've got uh, Sir, you spoke about uh, American generals coming from Afghanistan and speaking to people here. Is America going to be happy if there are Indian troops in Afghanistan? Is this an issue that you brought up with the Indian government and the Indian military? And secondly, you did speak about Jaisi Mohammad, lashkar e Toiba, the Haqqanis. What exactly has America recently told Pakistan about action against these three organizations? Yeah, so no on the you know, the first uh, part of your question, no one has suggested the presence of Indian troops on, in Afghanistan. No one has requested that, and, and that's not uh, something that's even on the table. Uh, secondly, you know, we have, we have taken a very tough line on groups emanating, terrorist groups that uh, operate from Pakistani soil. And uh, you may be aware of some of the congressional restrictions that are now imposed because of 
these groups that have done significant damage uh, to our personnel, to our troops, to Afghan uh, uh, people. And so it has been a very um, kind of tough and concerted message to the Pakistani uh, leadership about getting control, eliminating the safe havens, holding perpetrators accountable, and shutting down this kind of cross-border activity. And that, um, that message has been clear and unequivocal, and I believe that will continue. Okay, take one. Last question. Uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, you mentioned about uh, the counter one's extremism and one direction is affecting the Muslim communities as well across uh, the globe and that we see on the New Year Eve in Istanbul, uh, people who died mostly from the Middle East and a very dear family friend of ours, Mr. Albus Rizbi from Mumbai, he was one of them. Uh, in uh, Ramadan last year I was in Medina when the bombing happened at the entrance of the Holy Mosque. And, uh, and the e by evening, the Saudi authorities were denying that it was any involvement from Saudi. But later in the morning, it was discovered that Abdullah Utaibi, an 18 year old boy from Taif, a village in Najd, was influenced to go to Medina and bomb the uh, mosque. And the intended uh, casualty was uh, people from India and probably South Asia. And their justification was that they engage in. Uh, practices of shirk and beda and the whole syncretic culture of India. So how uh, India can be a leading example of, uh, you know, from the Muslim perspective also uh, to the world that these practices are so important in engaging. What is your idea about engaging these practitioners and the message from India to the world? Yeah, look, it's, um, this is what I hope all of you uh, are talking about over the next day or so and, and yesterday as well that uh, when you have inclusive governance, when you have robust civil society, uh, when you have society represented in kind of all elements of, of the economy, um, that in and of itself is a, is a um, testament to India's kind of history, but also a, um, a recipe for success. And, and obviously it's not perfect on any, any given day and that there are occasionally pockets of, of you know, confrontation, but overall the story is such a positive one. And um, to the extent there are leaders um, that can be engaged with in different parts of, of the Middle East, you know, I think about um, what the U.S. and India now are doing to train peacekeepers, what we're doing to train women from Afghanistan on entrepreneurship and business development, what we're doing in global health security, uh, broadly around the world, uh, what we're doing with, Af with African farmers to improve uh, their crop development. I give you those examples to say we are now kind of expanding the reach of our work together. And to the extent we can be out talking to leaders in the community about what's important, these notions of inclusivity and combating uh, messages and offering different alternatives, and draining the pool of potential recruits. That's, that's really powerful. And um, again, I'll just go back to say, we can't do it by ourselves. And, and much better if there's a country right here in South Asia, the world's largest democracy, that can be a, a leading uh, voice for those, those ideas. And, and you know, the time is now. It's needed now for people to be out there spreading those, uh, spreading those messages. I uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, and as uh, you all know, this is also his farewell call, and uh, he would be returning to the U.S. Uh, we would like to wish him uh, the very best of luck and Godspeed uh, while he is in the U.S. And we uh, will hope that he would return to India sooner than later. You just have to invite me to a conference. <laughs> and uh, I'll come back. And uh, I generally look forward to his coming because these two years uh, have been very intense uh, in our cooperation, not only between the two countries, but even between the BIF and the U.S. Embassy. And they've been always forthcoming in whatever one requested them. So it's been great, Ambassador, uh, under your leadership. We've really had a very enjoyable uh, time together. And we'd like to wish you all the very best. And now 
with that I request our chairman uh, and Mr. Layer to make present you a small uh, memento. <laughs> Say a few words. Ambassador, thank you for uh, sparing your time and coming. As far as uh, radicalization and uh, excessive uh, uh, terrorism is concerned, there are two constituents. There is externally state-sponsored uh, terrorism and uh, radicalization efforts. And those can be tackled uh, effectively by international cooperation, especially by the efforts of countries which have leverage against the perpetrators of that uh, effort. The other is domestically generated uh, That is in the air, and unfortunately, there is no antibiotic pill which can cure that. That requires constant uh, interaction, academic, philosophical, cultural, to tackle that. And uh, it requires international cooperation, like these conferences which we are holding. And uh, we are grateful to your embassy co-sponsoring this thing with us. I will leave it at that. We appreciate your uh, association with VIF. It was in the first week of your resuming office, That's true. in the first week of your resuming office that you came here. And now, towards the end of your time, we are pleased to have you here again. I think what will be a source of great satisfaction to you and a source of uh, great pleasure for us that you demit office at a time when Indo-American relations are at the highest level yeah, yeah. ever. <laughs> and uh, as General Witt said, we look forward to your, uh, I'm not going to say next visit, we look forward to your repeated visits to this country and to the BIF. And I thank you once again for This is my passion, and um, so you'll continue to see me. Thank you. Thank you very much.